Hello, everyone. I'm Eve O'Dell, the president of Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and this is World Review, our weekly look at news from around the world. And this week, we're taking a look at Secretary of State's Antony Blinken's visit, his first as Secretary of State, to Beijing. What did he meet? Uh, who did he meet? What did he get to say? And how did it all turn out? Then we'll take a look at the new national security strategy issued by the German government. It's first, and at the same time, the first uh, in, of this government's uh, meeting with the Chinese that was taking place earlier this week as well. And finally, diplomacy seems to be heating up with both Iran and Saudi Arabia. Is the U.S. back into the Middle East? And how is that diplomacy likely to evolve? Here to talk about all of these issues are Bethany Allen Ibrahimian, China reporter for Axios, Stephen Erlanger, Brussels chief diplomatic correspondent for the New York Times based in Brussels, and Philip Stevens, contributing uh, editor to the Financial Times. Thanks all for joining us. Great to see you uh, again. Bethany, let's start with you. You followed the first uh, visit of uh, Antony Blinken, the first of a Secretary of State since 2018 to Beijing. He did get to meet with uh, all of the people he was supposed to meet, including President Xi Jinping. But what did he hear when he was there? And what does this meeting really mean in terms of uh, the relationship between China and China? Uh, and the United States. Sure. Well, it's, uh, I mean, it's a little bit of a victory or a, a success in and of itself that Blinken was able to go at all. It's the first time that a U.S. Secretary of State has gone to China in almost five years. The last time was Pompeo under the Trump administration in uh, 20, in 2018, late 2018. And Blinken was supposed to take this trip earlier this year in February, but he canceled that visit or suspended the visit uh, after there was a Chinese spy balloon, as it was being called, that floated across the U.S. and was eventually shot down by the U.S. military, and that that really put a, a chill on U.S.-China relations. And in the the months since then, the the U.S. has tried very hard to restart high level dialogues with China, but had been rebuffed multiple times, including recently at the Shangri La dialogue in Singapore where the U.S. Uh, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin had asked to meet with his Chinese counterpoint part was, but was rebuffed. So it was, it was definitely good to, to see this high level meeting. There are so many concerns, not just in the U.S., but throughout the, the whole region, uh, all of China's neighbors. Everyone in the, in the region is very concerned that U.S.-China relations are at an unsustainably low level, that the, the tensions are just too dangerous. Um, and that you know the the lack of communication between between the two superpowers is um, was just un, you know becoming so, such so dangerous. So it was great he could go. He met for seven and almost seven and a half hours with Chinese Foreign Minister Qin Gong, um, a real marathon session. Blinken described the session as substantive, candid. He had a shorter session uh, with Wang Yi, China's top diplomat. Now, Wang Yi's remarks after that meeting were a little bit harsher. He blamed the U.S. entirely for the, 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 the low point in U.S.-China relations. And then Blinken was able to meet uh, with, with Xi Jinping for about 30 minutes on Monday. And we, we didn't know if that meeting would happen. The U.S. side didn't know if that meeting would happen kind of until the last minute. And but the you know the readouts from these meetings, what what Blinken said about it in his press conference, and what the Chinese side said about it officially, were good. There were it was a low bar. There were you know the the State Department went into this saying that they were not expecting any significant deliverables, but that they wanted to maintain uh, to reestablish high level dialogue in order to responsibly manage competition. That is how the U.S is framing how they want their relationship with China to be. And Blinken said that was, uh, you know, basically accomplished. He said, we came here for that, and that's what we did. There was, uh, I would say, one significant disappointment, although no one promised that this would happen, but the U.S. has really wanted to restart military-to-military -military, uh, communications Specifically, the MMCA, which is a, um, it's not high level. It's actually a very, you know, functional lower level uh, communications channel between the U.S. and Chinese militaries at, at a lower level. 
to help discuss and perhaps prevent or at least deal with these uh, these incidents that keep happening in the South China Sea and the Taiwan Strait, again, that just happened in the lead up to Shangri-La uh, as the U.S. was transiting the Taiwan Strait with Canada's Navy. There was a, a dangerous interaction there and also between two uh, airplanes, a U.S. Um, airplane a, a jet fighter and a, a Chinese a PLA jet over the South China Sea to try to create the, the systems and the structures to prevent those kinds of dangerous maneuvers from spiraling into uh, you know a national or international military crisis so that so the chinese side refused uh to restart those those communications so that's that's not great but but basically bottom line the us and china are talking to each other again Qin Gong accepted an invitation to come to the us when the time is right when uh, a suitable time and that is encouraging at a very basic level uh, jaw jaw is better than uh, uh, war war, Philip. Uh, that's uh, uh, as Churchill as Churchill would say. And in that sense, restarting the kind of communication that is necessary uh, is important. At the same time, uh, the Chinese make clear that they're deeply unhappy uh, with the United States. Uh, they they uh, I think as as Bethany said, uh, Wang Yi said that it was the lowest point in the bilateral relationship since uh, normalization. Uh, of relationship, uh, that's a that's a pretty low point when you think about it. And then the 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 the, the, um, the atmospherics uh, were a little different. Uh, uh, Xi Jinping did not uh, invite Blinken to sit on a chair next to him, but it was a, a long table in which he was at the head and Blinken was to his right. Um, what uh, what 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 did it all mean to you when you looked at this? Yes, great communication, but what is this going to do for uh, the relationship? Uh, is it uh, is it any more stable than it was uh, before Tony Blinken uh, set foot in China? Yes, I think as you said, by you know by definition, the fact that the two sides um, are now communicating, talking to each other, makes it more stable. And what Europeans will hope is that it provides a foundation stone as it were a, a base from which yeah, there can be further improvements in communications in the military communications and if you like diffusing the immediate tension about taiwan you know the great fear in europe is of a you know a, of a, a miscalculation or a misunderstanding between the us and china which sees china try to preempt things and and basically take over Taiwan militarily, you know, in the in the quite short term. So anything that pushes it back, um, that back is good. I mean, you know, this has coincided with a visit to Germany from a high level delegation of Chinese ministers, which is a bit embarrassing in some ways, but because Germany in particular and Europe overall haven't quite calibrated their own relationship with China. You know, it's a it's a partner on some things, climate change, it's a competitor, competitor economically, it's also a rival. But, you know, we're not quite sure where, you know, where the balance between those things are. So I think it it gives reason for, uh, I think, Europeans, it gives time and space for Europeans to think more carefully and to put some flesh, if you like, on the bones of the de-risking uh, strategy in the relationship which Ursula von der Leyen uh, set out uh, a couple of months ago. So, yeah, I think, you know, I think basically across Europe, you'll find even some of the more hawkish um, uh, governments uh, pretty content that, you know, things, are, things look a bit stable for a while. Uh, stable, uh, Steve, probably is, uh, that's certainly what everybody's hoping for. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, of, of course, uh, I think inside the United States, um, uh, he uh, uh, Blinken was was widely criticized uh, for going uh, because you know talking apparently is apparently war war is better than jaw jaw or talking is a form of weakness. It also comes on the heels of reports uh, of a a new or at least refurbished Chinese. Uh, spying station in in, in Cuba, which uh, some have taken as uh, as shocking proof that the Chinese spy on uh, on other countries, and uh, in and of itself, a, uh, an interesting an interesting perspective. But how would you characterize? Do you think that I mean, the positive move, but 
still a long way to go or and and how do you think it plays domestically which ultimately is what is the a if not the biggest constraint in some ways on uh the ability of the administration to have this kind of managed competition uh in the way that they're seeking it oh i am shocked shocked that countries are spying on one another i mean how dare they right yeah. no i i think your our two colleagues have been quite on the mark here. This is the beginning of, it's like one step in a long, long journey to restore some sense of civility and, and discussion between two countries that clearly see each other as rivals, competitors, and, 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 and potential enemies. Not yet, let's be clear, not yet. Um, and Taiwan is one of those incredibly complicated issues. The U.S. has tried to leave it as ambiguous as, as um, possible, but when President Biden starts talking about going to Taiwan's defense militarily, which we're not doing for Ukraine, by the way, if um, China should attack, uh, that rings terrible bells inside Beijing too. Uh, from Beijing's point of view, they can look and see that we keep saying, the United States, the West keeps saying, we're not trying to contain China, but you, one has to wonder whether we actually are. Uh, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, talks about um, creating a special garden of, of, of specific technologies that we want to protect from from the Chinese or not allow the Chinese to have with a with a big wall he talks about a small garden well the Europeans think the garden is Texas size this is what this is what really bothers them and European officials who I've been talking to I mean they're certainly glad there's conversation going on um and joe and, and president biden has said that xi jinping has been interested in restoring some sort of dialogue but they are very very uh worried about the way the americans are acting on trade the amount of pressure they're putting on on european companies what to what to sell what not to sell um on huawei they they kind of get it. No one in Europe is very naive about China, but they don't see China as the threat that the United States does. And this came out when Emmanuel Macron, on his way back from China, gave a kind of think tanky kind of interview in which he said, basically, Taiwan isn't a European interest. We shouldn't get dragged into it. Now, I think he overstated that because Taiwan does matter for, for alliance security, for trade routes, for, frankly, the world economy. Um, but uh, that gives you an indication, and there was a recent poll from the European Council on Foreign Relations of, of like 16,000 Europeans in 11 countries that said it was not very well phrased the question but should there be a confrontation between the us and china over over taiwan 62 percent were kind of wanted to be neutral now the question didn't ask what kind of support europe would be providing maybe people thought the us expected european battleships which i i don't think washington does but it gives you an idea of how nervous people are that, you know, Washington and China are going to end up destroying the world in the name of patriotism. Uh, uh, interesting, fascinating. Beth Bethany, uh, just uh, finally back to you uh, on, on, on your perception of the Chinese um, uh, interpretation of what happened, I think. I think uh, we, you and, and, and others uh, really focused on the U.S. perception. I think that makes sense. It was a step forward. Uh, but how did the Chinese see it? In particular, sort of help us understand the difference on the one hand with uh, this idea that we really can't talk to the Americans on military things because of what it is that 
the U.S. is doing. They also, again, refuse to have any discussion about nuclear weapons, uh, uh, even as they and we, the United States, are rapidly increasing and modernizing our nuclear uh, weapons issues. Uh, and, and yet there are all these conversations, some of them uh, secret or they only come out afterwards, including CIA Director Bill Burns going at the at the invitation of the Chinese intelligence uh, uh, service to go to Beijing. And of course, the uh, meeting that uh, Jake Sullivan had with Wang Yi for two days in, in, in Vienna and, and, and this this open meeting. Uh, how do how should we interpret what the Chinese are trying to get out of this? Yes. Well, um, a top line there is that Xi Jinping did say that uh, the meetings that Blinken had um, marked progress. He used the word progress. So he was casting it overall as positive. But uh, I think it's really important to, to distinguish that Chinese perceptions here are very different and Chinese goals are very different from those of the U.S. And there's sort of two different areas I want to look at. One of them is, you know, the U.S. frame is we want to responsibly manage competition. Xi Jinping, in, in his statement, essentially rejected that frame. He said uh, competition is not the trend of the world. You know, the competition between great powers is not the trend of the world. What he means by that is that's not how we're viewing this. How are they viewing that? You know, the, the Chinese side is harder in some ways, it's a harder line. What, they're, what they want to be saying is, no, you need to not do those things. You know, we don't want to try to have a give and take on what we can have in this world. We just want those things. And the, the Chinese side is more willing to push, more willing to, to um, erode norms, more willing to take risks than the U.S. side, and I, it is you know, I personally think that it, that's because the Chinese do not have a lot of experience, almost none, in fact, as a superpower, and don't feel that sense of responsibility towards the world that the U.S. truly does, or, or you know, many people in the U.S. do. And the other is the other point I want to make is kind of a corollary to that, and that is on this military to military communications, which I think is kind of a a subset of the same the same phenomenon. Why wouldn't the Chinese military want to talk to the U.S. military? What's the point of rejecting that? Here's the point. The, the Chinese position is that the U.S. should not be doing freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea or through the Taiwan Strait. This is bad behavior. We are not going to create safer conditions for the U.S. to continue its bad behavior. That is China's position. and. Again, you see this sense of more willing to, I think, take certain risks. And why is that? Uh, you know, newness to being a superpower. I, I also think it's possi possible that it's because China experienced a very different Cold War than the U.S. did. You know, we faced, you know, existential threats you know, head on with, with the Soviet Union and had to learn over a long period of time how to manage that. You had to. It was it was about the survival of humanity, truly. And China had a you know, China's Cold War experience. It was very closed and on itself. It had an argument with the Soviet Union. It didn't bear that burden. And I think that those memories live deeply in the U.S. State Department, in the U.S. Department of Defense, and uh, you know even in the in the minds of, of people who are you know who grew up in that era or people who are still alive, like, like Henry Kissinger, and still influential. On the Chinese side, they don't have that experience. Their primary experience in the latter half of the 20th century was of not having any power, not, not having enough. Bethany, can I, I ask you just... Yeah, quick, no, no, go ahead. I think just, that's, that, just, that makes I a mean, lot of sense. One quick question, which is how much are the, is it a matter of the Chinese being offended that we've sanctioned their, their defense minister? So why would their defense minister talk to us if he's been sanctioned? I don't know how important um, this is, but it, it seems to be worth mentioning anyway. Yeah, well, he was sanctioned already when they uh, when he was put in that position. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is in itself a statement. What that's right. saying is, you know, it's a power move, in fact. Mm -hmm. It's saying, you know, we're, we don't care about your sanction. If you want the thing that you say you want, which is dialogue, you're going to have to walk back from your position, which is sanctioning. And again, we're seeing this hard line, willing to take away dialogue in order to push the Chinese line. 
um, I, I don't think it's a matter of offense. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's it's more a power move. Thank you. I think um, I think what we're saying, Philip. Do you want to jump in? Because I think this is a really important and interesting um, set of issues yeah. here. Yeah, I think. I mean, the only thing I'd say is that I think it's natural that the Chinese are going to be more assertive and take more risks because they're the power that wants to overturn the status quo. The U.S. position is we want to pretend. So it's it's naturally a conservative position. So the U.S. and and Europe, you know, that that diplomacy will be necessarily about engagement. If you want to, you know, throw everything up in the air, which basically that's what China wants to do long term. It wants it wants to run the Western Pacific. Uh, The U.S. is saying no. So but I do think that China has learned a bit of a lesson in the last couple of years. One of its objectives has always been to split Europe from the U.S., I think what it's realized is that by being too aggressive in its relationship with the US, it tends to drive Europe back into a, in a sort of Atlanticist mode. So I think I think the Chinese are learning a bit about the sort of balance of diplomacy. So it's a the Chinese diplomacy in Europe now is is much more or is much less aggressive than it was, say, two years ago. Yeah, I think that's uh, that that that's very true, and they're learning that that being too close to Russia may, in fact, be part of that problem as well. Yeah. Uh, I, a lot of fascinating things. The only uh, only thing I, I sort of uh, uh, emphasize um, when I talk to you as officials who were part of this this this, uh, this uh, meeting uh, that Blinken had, um, they stressed the importance of both sides being able to hear the other side's argument and that they spend a lot of time, mm-hmm. not just on specifics, but on sort of making the case for what they are doing. I do think, and Bethany sort of put her finger on it, in some ways it's a dialogue off the death. And it may be for various different reasons that that is happening. But there is this sense that we are talking about managing competition that in many ways the Chinese, they don't want to compete. They want to win. Uh, 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 in, 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 and, and, and change the status quo and change the, uh, the, 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 the system, which you would expect from any rising power. And that makes it very difficult to have, uh, the kind of dialogue that, uh, that is necessary. So, uh, a fascinating insight. Thanks to Bethany for, for, for bringing it out. Um, let's, let's, uh, talk about uh, another country, uh, Steve, that has been trying to figure out how to uh, how to live in the new world that all of a sudden emerged uh, on their doorstep. Turned out it was the same world before, they just hadn't uh, hadn't really focused on it in that way. And that's Germany, which um, uh, just uh, uh, just last week issued its first national security strategy, uh, usually uh, not an event that many people spend a lot of time thinking or talking about because uh, uh, these are these documents tend to be uh, pretty dry. But uh, uh, it, it was notable that it came out first, uh, uh, that the, it finally came out. It was took a long time. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, the question is, is there a new Weltanschauung? Is there a new view of the world that has now uh, become uh, truly German that uh, these three parties who are part of the coalition uh, were able to agree on? And if so, uh, what does it say? Well, let's go back a little bit and ask yourself, why was there never one before? Which is really fascinating. The United States has one for a long time. The French have one. The British have one. The Germans never had one because they never thought they needed one because their national security strategy was to be embedded in NATO, embedded in the European Union, the transatlantic alliance. That was their national security strategy. And so they didn't need one. And why did they decide to have one? Because of Donald Trump, not because of the Ukraine war. The agreement of the coalition to have this thing which was part of their coalition agreements, was before the war because they started government in December, I think, um, and the war started in February. So the war brought along, you know, what Olaf Scholz quite nicely called a Zeitenbender, a turning point, and that changed a lot of thinking in Germany, at least among the elites, and it scared a lot of normal people. Because suddenly Germany, which had always thought of itself after the Second War as a peace project, 
now had to confront a war with a Russia that had been trying to get along with and bring into the West for the last 50 years. So this was a shock, particularly a shock to young Germans who had had 30 years of thinking that war happened somewhere else and that their whole rate, Germany's raison d'etre was to sp spread peace in the world and good feeling and be nice to Israel and so on and so on. So, so this has been a big shock. So then the coalition government, which is very split, as you know, it's run by the Social Democrats in the Chancery. The Foreign Office is run by the Greens. The Financial Office is run by the Free Democrats. They wanted to pull together a strategy that would be integrated security, which is their cliche, which was to talk about foreign domestic trade threats to Germany. And the fight over it lasted a very long time. One of the key elements everyone thought would come out of it, which was the German National Security Council, was dropped fairly quickly because they couldn't agree on it. And tellingly, given our our last discussion, uh, there's a whole separate paper on Germany's st strategy toward China, which is coming out on July 5th. And why was it not part of the whole strategy? Because they didn't want it to come out when the Chinese premier was in Germany. They wanted to wait, which makes you wonder what the whole thing was about. I tease some German officials who worked very hard on this, that the final result, which is like 46 pages, it's very nicely done. It looks like a travel agency brochure. It's full of nice pictures and it's sort of nicely designed. And it does express, I think, a quite good common view of where Germany is, where its friends are, where its threats are, but it doesn't advance our understanding very far. And the problem is its ambitions, which are real, are not matched by means um, because the means are financial. And Germany is always going to be fighting over budget spending. I mean, will they make 2% of GDP as they're supposed to by next year? Well, no. In fact, the strategy hedges and says, on a multi-year average, we'll get there sort of, eventually it'll be fine, <laughs> which is not necessarily so encouraging. It's basically adopts on China in its brief mention of China, the EU's language, uh, which is, if I get this right, is a, uh, economic competitor, strategic, uh, sy systemic rival, and uh, possible partner, right? All those things. So I think it's really was a good exercise. The problem is it had too many chefs uh, and the poor officials were trying to pull together, you know, a recipe from a, a lot of different points of view. Um, but it is a first step, and I think it's important because it's all part of Germany taking itself seriously and its own interests seriously. Um, and so I personally welcome it as an advance on a Germany that basically sits back and lets others decide e everything about European security. Philip, uh, Steve, I thought that that was a really uh, nicely nicely summarized uh, and and put well into place. But Philip, uh, aside from means, which has been I think the, the issue that most people have commented on in terms of uh, uh, you know the the the, the ends means uh, disconnect, particularly in the defense area. Uh, in, in some ways, it also lacks strategy. Uh, it, it's supposed to be a national security strategy, but it kind of reads like. Uh, here's how we think about the world is, but it doesn't really say or have a lot about here's how Germany is going to act in that world. Uh, and as the largest, most important European country, um, the the absence of that strategic, not just visionary, but strategic sense um, is, is somewhat surprising, given that this is supposed to be a national security strategy document. I think that's absolutely right. But I think, to be fair to Germany, most national security strategies 
um, are more descriptive than prescriptive. And generally speaking, even the US one and certainly the British one, they reflect the sort of uh, the, the jostling. I mean, in the case of Germany, it was a coalition. But if you read the British one, it's, you know, the MOD has got to have its say. The intelligence services have got to have their bit, the foreign office, the development, you know, agencies and whatever. So you never get a sort of perfect document so i think steve's absolutely right you got to, we should see this as a staging post rather than the elucidation of a, of a sort of uh, a proper strategy but i think it's nonetheless a, a, an important staging post i mean what we've seen in in europe i think since the you know since putin's uh, war on ukraine began is an awakening um, we've seen you know, all sorts of changes. We've seen Sweden and Finland head for NATO. We've seen Denmark drop its opt out from European Union security policy. Um, we've seen Germany announce its Titan vendor. We've seen the European Commission provide money for arms for Ukraine. So there is a an awakening going on and a, a beginning of awareness. You even this sort of wind of change is even now lapping just about getting to Ireland's shores where, you know, this is fiercely neutral since, you know, the creation of the Irish state in 1922. It's now beginning to ask itself, you know, can we uh, be the odd person out? Well, Austria is the other EU nation that remains neutral, but that's complicated because it's part of the post war settlement between the Soviet Union and the West and there's an international treaty. But so there is a change. So I think if you want to be if you want to see the cup as half full, you should see it as, you know, Germany was, as Steve said, it didn't think it needed a foreign policy or a defense policy, now recognizes it does need one and has to look at these threats. Hasn't yet got to the stage where it says, OK, so how do we shape uh, this environment, this landscape, but it's moving. And I think events, uh, whether it's, you know, eventually the US saying to Europe, look, you've got to take care, more care of your own neighborhood or the pressures, continuing pressures in Ukraine from Putin, if there's not a U Ukrainian victory, I think, you know, the direction is, is there. So I, for today, anyway, I'm going to be half full on the German strategy. Half full makes sense. But uh, Bethany, when it comes to uh, China in the strategy, uh, uh, even half empty would be, uh, I think, would be very generous. Uh, as Steve explained that there's another strategy coming. Uh, that paper has been uh, being debated uh, uh, for, for months now as well on, on the China strategy, which I think was supposed to come out first rather than the national security strategy. Uh, uh, good luck getting it out on July fifth. Uh, that's uh, that's that seems optimistic. But uh, when you read this about China, uh, how do you think the Chinese are reading it? Yeah, well, I mean, the the change in Germany from just uh, 2017 has been dramatic. I spent two months in Berlin reporting on the federal elections that year, and uh, you know, with a strong eye towards China, as I always have. The only conversation in which China ever appeared in 2017 was business. It was a business partner, and that's all that it was. And although from, you know, from the Washington, D.C. perspective, the Germans can seem like they are lagging behind, um, but it has been a dramatic sea change. You know, the, the recognition there of that China is a threat, that it is a national security concern, even for Europe, is quite, quite dramatic. Um, I, I think that you know the, the the Chinese are very alarmed by this. For for years, they could operate under the the certainty that Europe was was just it was just going to be business. It was just going to be business as usual, and that was such a certainty for them. And I think if there's anything that China really miscalculated with supporting Russia and more or less supporting, uh, at least giving Russia cover for, for its invasion and certainly not trying to actively um, punish Russia or stop Russia from doing that. I think the Chinese really underestimated um, how alienating that would be for Europe. I think that they they saw Europe as, as just not willing to go with the U.S., as very divided, as not willing to stand up for their values. And, you know, for, so, you know, for, for Germany now to even be having a national security strategy so many of the moves they've taken, uh, you know, with, with Huawei, 
Um, I think, you know, this is, this is really, really, really not the direction that, that China wants to see things going. And as Steve said, you know, in our conversation earlier before, before the, before we had it, uh, in the recorded today, you know, he, he said, um, oh, now I'm, now I just lost my train of thought. What did you say about Germany? Oh dear. Well, anyway, the, the, the point is that, uh, things are, things are not looking good from Beijing. Ah, yes, that's, uh, there's been very intense diplomacy, uh, that China has made a really big push on diplomacy in Europe over the, over the past year. I, I mean, you know, I, I think it's it's hard for that to have a real effect when you have you know bombs falling on Ukraine, um, but we'll see. Yeah, no, I think that I think those are uh, those are all, uh, all 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 good points. And, and although uh, I I don't necessarily take the uh, half uh, half glass full usually in this case, uh, even on the business side, I think it's very interesting to see if you look at investment strategy. Uh, and the FT had a very good piece the other day about this. Uh, most of the investment, which is significant, that's still going from Germany into China, is coming from the car industry and, be, and the chemical uh, industry. Mm -hmm. right. uh, and and the Mittelstand, the the the, the smaller folks, uh, are no longer investing for new thing. They're keeping up what they have. Uh, but there is even in the economic side, you're seeing a pretty fundamental change. Uh, and as for the car industry. Uh, they're they're uh, facing a competition from uh, Chinese EVs now uh, that it really is going to be transformative, not just in China, but uh, uh, for another issue for another time, but uh, for the rest of the world, too. And the, the combustion engine uh, and the reliance that German automakers have on that uh, versus the, you know, basically a battery, a computer and four wheels, which is what uh, an EV is. Um, uh, that that's going to change uh, pretty fundamentally the nature of German economic uh, uh, engagement with China, but frankly, uh, its own economy in in and of itself. Uh, I think that's the next big big thing to happen, and I think smaller businesses understand this. The larger ones will be will no doubt catch up uh, on this. Um, so fascinating uh, about change and 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 Germany. I think it is uh, one of uh, uh, Schultz's closest aid once said that Germany is just entering, uh, exiting kindergarten and moving to first grade when it comes to being a national security actor. I think that's very unfair. Um, but I am quoting a senior official in the, in the German government. Uh, maybe with the security strategy, they have, uh, they, they've started uh, middle school. Who knows? Um, uh, uh, we're, we're waiting with a bated breath for the graduation from, from university. Uh, Philip, let me uh, uh, finally uh, turn to you. Uh, just a, a couple of really uh, interesting developments just in the last few weeks. Uh, a a re-engagement uh, of both the European three who have long led uh, the effort to address the Iranian nuclear program uh, and the United States uh, with some uh, interesting conversations in Oman and other places to try to figure out how to deal with the Iranian program and also a renewed effort by the United States, maybe following uh, the uh, the Chinese uh, success in helping Iran and Saudi uh, normalize a relationship, a renewed U.S. effort to uh, see if Israel and Saudi Arabia might not be able to join uh, some of the other Gulf states in uh, normalizing relations. Uh, are we seeing sort of a revival of uh, of Washington's interest in the Middle East or a new understanding that what, uh, as as one of our uh, uh, guests uh, uh, says when, when, when she's on, uh, you may try to middle, leave the Middle East, but the Middle East will never leave you. Uh, 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 that's Kim, uh, Kim Gattis. Uh, Kim Gattis, who says that. Um, how, how do you, how should we, uh, how, how should we look at these, uh, these new developments? Yeah, I think, I mean, that, that last point, there is a sort of Hotel California quality about the US and the Middle East. It could check out as the Biden administration tried to do, you know, a couple of years ago when, when it, when it started out. Uh, but you can't leave because your interests are such that, um, you know, too many things are going on which are directly relevant to US or its, its ally Israel's interests. Now, What's pulled it back in, and some of the and the EU three, as you say, two things have happened in the last um, couple of months that have pulled it back in. The first was the discovery that by um, uh, international atomic energy um, inspectors in Iran that Iran is now has the capability, at least, to process re 
uranium up to 83%, which is, they found some dust. They did an inspection. They found some dust, which showed this. Well, that's, you know, to make a bomb, you need it 90% plus. So they are just short of that, but not very far. Also, they have very large stocks now. Since the, since the Trump administration pulled out of the, of the, of the old international agreement, the JC. POA, the Iranians are building up very large stocks of fairly high, high, highly processed uranium, 60%. So there's now a view that, you know, look, Iran has got enough uranium that if it pushed for the last stage of processing, it could be there maybe in six months, a year. So there's an urgency about Iran. There's also, I think, a sense that the Iranians, having faced all these protests, at home domestically, um, feeling the pain now of sanctions are in the market perhaps for some sort of arrangement, not a reconstitution of the JCPOA, but at least for some, at least interim deal that would, would freeze things as they are. So the US, you know, obviously now, you know, doesn't want to see, you know, six months time or a year's time Iran, you know, be announcing itself as a, if not, a, you know, if not a complete nuclear power, a threshold state. So, so that's pulling both the, the U.S. and America back into discussions with Iran. With the U.S., I think they're sort of secret and third party and whatever, but there are discussions going on. Saudi Arabia, as you said, I think the, um, I think the administration was caught off balance, um, by the fact that China mediated this diplomatic truce between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Um, but I think also the signs of this revival of the possibility of Saudi recognition of Israel, and so you know, a restart for the Abrahams Accord, have basically persuaded the administration that they, they should see whether there is something there. Because you know, if Israel and Saudi Arabia and Israel are going to do a deal, as it were, in which Saudi Arabia recognizes Israel and begins to normalize relations. The Saudis are going to want things from the Americans, and the Israelis are going to want things from the Americans in terms of security. So you know, that's a deal that could really that can't be done bilaterally. It needs American mediation. So I think the administration has said, well, look, you know, this is far from certain, very difficult, but we should we should try and we should, if you like, send a message that we haven't completely left the region. We haven't just said, you know, look, we're out of there forever. So, but I mean, I think on both counts, you know, a deal with the Iranians is going to be incredibly difficult. A deal that, that you know, because the Iranians want some relaxation of sanctions, you know, in order to sort of hold things, I think, as they are. It's going to be very difficult politically in the US, I think politically in, in, in parts of Europe. And, you know, the, the Saudi, one of the Saudi demands is for them to be allowed to process uranium, they say for commercial purposes, and they want the US to sanction that or to, you know, to agree to that. That's a very, very big call for the Biden administration. So, you know, it, this is, this looks, <laughs> So use the analogy we were talking about earlier. This looks a bit half empty to me, but you know we should. I, I think you know the fact that the U.S. is re-engaging diplomatically is good. But it's always good, as we were saying with China, if you know pot adversaries, potential adversaries, rivals talk to each other. Uh, we only have a few minutes left, but Bethany, I wanted to uh, ask you. Do the Chinese see this re-engagement as a response to what they were trying to do and, uh, and, and, and that this is a re-engagement in terms of competition with the Chinese? Or are they seeing this, well, no, there's some problems here. They need to be addressed. Uh, and it wouldn't it be good if we address them to, uh, 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 if the U.S. can address part of it and we can address part of it. Is it win-win, as they like to say, or they see this as zero-sum? Well, in the Middle East, uh, the, the Chinese have, have pretty typically tried to at least rhetorically walk a pretty delicate line. And, you know, they, the, the Chinese have long engaged in talks with the Taliban, hosted 
talks with the Taliban and for years and years and years were always very quiet about it, you know, never tried to make it an issue of competition, at least not not formally or not um, explicitly. And we also saw that, uh, you know, in, in the recent uh, negotiations with Iran and Saudi Arabia, although they they were a little bit a little bit more obvious uh, in in their intentions of sort of challenging the U.S. in the region by even just by addressing this very issue, going after this very issue. But for example, in the Iran and, and Saudi Arabia talks, they avoided using English uh, as one of the languages. You know, they 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 had Chinese and they had translators and others, but they they didn't use English as a as a as a common language there. And that's there's only one reason that you do that, and that's to make a point, right? So it's it's not clear. Uh, they they haven't signaled that, that I have seen. They haven't signaled a, a, a displeasure in the U.S. reengagement, and and they do that because they are trying to 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 say to make the point um, that that they simply belong to be there, that they have things to offer, that they can be constructive. Now that can be true, and China can also be doing it as a you know a geopolitical influence move, which they most certainly are. And we saw that uh, last week. You know, um, uh, the the president of the Palestinian Authority, uh, what was his name, Abbas, Abbas what was his name, um, was was uh, recently was was just in Beijing, and um, uh, you know, Chinese officials said uh, that they would that they were were willing to help in a you know a negotiation process um, between. Oh dear, Fatah and Hamas. Sorry, that isn't. This is not my area of specialty. No, no, no. That's right. Uh, but uh, you know, sort of dipping their toe in into this this Israel Palestine issue, um, to which you know I say, by all means, no one else has been able to fix this. Yeah, well, that's uh, uh, Steve. Uh, literally uh, thirty seconds. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know this part of the world uh, region very well, <laughs> particularly uh, Palestinian-Israeli negotiations. Would love to see the Chinese succeeding. I think we all would, uh, yeah. but uh, not like. I don't expect it. I have to say, uh, look, you're gonna, Iran is a nuclear threshold state. The Biden people want not to have an Israeli war against Iran before the presidential election. So they're trying to calm things down and they'll give Iran something, we'll see. And uh, the problem with JCPOA, just besides being dead, is Russia and China now with their unlimited friendship have no interest in pushing Iran to sign the way they did before. So it's it's really very, very troublesome. And the thing about Saudi, which fascinates me, is whatever happened to King Faisal and the Arab League documents that were supposed to have to happen before anyone recognized Israel, I mean, for the Saudis to go back on that would be one of MBS's biggest reversals, to be honest. It'd be very interesting to see if it happens. If it happens, we will be discussing it here on World Review, but not today, just another time. I want to thank uh, uh, Bethany Allen Abrahamian, uh, Steve Erlanger, and Philip Stevens for really an excellent conversation. Thanks so much. And thank you for joining us. We'll be back next week with another edition of World Review. Until then, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.